morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to all who regularly worship here. Welcome to all visitors and welcome to anybody joining us online. This is the house of God. All are welcome. All are welcome in this place. You'll see today that the worship team are leaving the service. Uh, but next week we're very pleased to welcome back our interim moderator, Michael Allardyce. We owe so much to Michael. He has nurtured us through difficult times and we really appreciate him. Just a little bit of update. Corinne, of course, should be standing here where I am, but again she's had to go down to York to try and sort out care for her mum. She must be so emotionally and physically drained. It's not been an easy task. And Elspeth is home from hospital. I'm not sure she's quite as robust as she would like to be. And unfortunately, Mary has had to be moved to Amundsen. But that's very good news in many ways because she's going to get an awful lot of help to get her back on her feet. I've just heard that Daisy has been taken to hospital. And if you want more information, you can ask Alan about that. But good news, and it's lovely to finish on good news, is that Jim and Leslie are once more grandparents again, safely delivered the little girl this morning. So uh, congratulations to both of them. And now let us draw near to God. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are funded by all who delight in him. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Now this is just a short psalm of only ten verses. In the first nine verses, praise God for the many ways he is faithful to his people and upholds righteousness. For example, it says, Great are the works of the Lord, glorious and majestic are his deeds. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. All his precepts are trustworthy. He provides redemption for his people. But the final verse, the final verse with the line, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now is, is this not a strange departure in a psalm which talking of God's love and care and then suggests a relationship based on fear? We might question whether fear should exist in loving relationship and whether the love of God has to be earned by our good deeds. I would agree with the suggestion of Vicky Steigen, a Church of Scotland youth worker facilitator, who presented her thoughts on the Church of Scotland website for this week's lecture and readings, that a better translation would be reverent submission, meaning that to have proper respect and regard for God's goodness and faithfulness will help us begin to recognize it and seek to live up to it. We try to do what is good, not because we fear divine retribution, we don't, because we love and respect God and wish to hold ourselves in a proper relationship with Him and we want to live up to God's expectation for us. We shall now say in 599, Holy Spirit, hear us.
of creation, whose creative power and love are seen in the beauty, the majesty, the wonder of the heavens and the earth. We praise you for each act of creation, which tells of your glory and witnesses to your love. We praise you for the summer days, for the long sunlit hours, for the vibrant colours and the heavy scents of the summer flowers that assail our senses. We praise you for days of rest and recreation. Time to set aside the normal activities of our lives, to enjoy the beauty of the natural world, to inspire us, to renew us, to refresh us. We pray that through the beauty and wonder which surrounds us our spirit will be lifted and our physical and mental health restored after so many months of hardship, anxiety, fear and despair. Lord Jesus, you came to bring us new life and sent the Holy Spirit to breathe new life into your people, encouraging and equipping them for the service of your kingdom. We pray that as we look to the beauty and wonder of creation for days of rest and recreation, we can turn to you, that through the Holy Spirit presence we will be given all we need to live full lives, to serve you, to see around us the evidence of your love, and receive that new life which you have promised. God, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Enabler, help us to walk more closely with you, willing to follow where you lead, trusting in you for the future, looking to you for the present, in the knowledge that in all things and at all times, in all places, we are held in your love. Amen. And now let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, Now, O Lord my God, 
You have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honour, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Ephesians chapter 5, reading verses 15 to 20. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the next hymn is hymn 616, There's a Spirit in the Air.
Old Testament reading today, we hear about the beginning of Solomon's reign. He's overwhelmed with the task of following his father David, who was a revered as a ruler and enjoyed his faithfulness to God. Now, we can feel the Solomon, as most of us here have probably had to step into the shoes of someone who's been very successful and well respected. And we know that feeling when Solomon says in chapter 3, verse 7, But I'm only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. It's called running scares. God visits Solomon in a dream. He says to Solomon, he can have riches, power, death to his enemies, a long life, whatever he wants. But Solomon asks for wisdom. Now, you would think as king that Solomon would be surrounded by very learned counsel, giving him the widest breadth of knowledge to help him rule his people. Wouldn't that be enough to help him be a wise ruler? Well, no. Wisdom and knowledge, both recurring themes in the Bible, are related, but they're not the same. Wisdom is distinct from knowledge. The primary difference between the two words is that wisdom involves a healthy dose of perspective and the ability to make sound judgments. Knowledge, on the other hand, is information gained over time, often through study, reasoning and experience. We learn as much from our mistakes as our successes. Anyone can become knowledgeable about a subject by reading, researching and memorising facts. Now, knowledge can exist without wisdom, but not the other way around. Wisdom is the fitting application of knowledge. Let me explain in simple terms. Knowledge understands that the light has turned red. Wisdom applies the brakes. Knowledge sees the quicksand. Wisdom walks around it. And in biblical terms, knowledge memorizes the Ten Commandments. Wisdom obeys them. Knowledge learns of God. Wisdom loves him. If knowledge can be gained through education, can we be taught to be wise in the same fashion? A renowned professor, Charles Brown, said that the mere act of listening to statements about sound advice doesn't ensure the transfer of wisdom. Wisdom implies more than merely being able to process information in a logical way. Knowledge becomes wisdom when we can have the ability to assimilate and apply this knowledge to make right decisions. Now we probably all know someone who is knowledgeable in their own mind and they can't stop speaking. And I think if we looked in the mirror, we'd probably see that person. We're all very fond to spout knowledge, but there is a saying that goes, knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. Wise people are blessed with good judgment. They can put things into perspective and see the bigger picture. In addition, they possess the qualities of sincerity and authenticity. The former imply a willingness to say what you mean, and the latter to be what you are, not changing yourself to meet different situations, you know, like putting on airs and graces. What makes wisdom more important than riches is that it enables us to live well, our mental and physical health flourishes when we are confident with our beliefs and values. Mahatma Gandhi illustrates this well when he once said, happiness is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are all in harmony. Well, we may crave to be wise, but where do we start? Becoming wise is a very personal quest. Wisdom is a gift from God. James 1 verse 5 states, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. This is an offer open to all of us, no matter what our intellectual level may be. But you may have guessed it, there's a little work involved. Ecclesiastes 7 verses 23 to 24, Solomon makes it clear that getting wisdom is a challenging process. There are four broad ways in which we can gain wisdom. Solomon says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom in 
in Proverbs 4.10. This has been echoed in our introduction in the last verse of Psalm 111. But how should we fear God? What it means to fear God has been thought of by some authors as contrasting filial fear with servile fear. Filial fear is the type of respect and love a child has for a parent, a fear of offending or letting down the one they love the most. In contrast, servile fear is the kind of fear that a prisoner has for his jailer or executioner. The second step to getting wisdom is to desire it with all our heart. As Solomon says, we must look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. Then we should pray for wisdom. Matthew 21 verse 22 says, If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. And we should pray wholeheartedly because as James 1 verse 6 adds, when you ask, you must not doubt, because one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The fourth step to getting wisdom is studying and meditating on God's Word. We shouldn't rely on our own understanding, but lean on the wisdom and insight produced by Christians throughout church's history. To be wise, we need to be humble. Humility is derived from a willingness to recognize the limitations of our knowledge. By accepting this ignorance, we are better prepared to accept our own fallibility, which opens a willingness to accept guidance from God. Wisdom is a gift from God, offered freely to all who are faithful to Him. Let's not just put it in the bottom drawer alongside the other gifts that we don't want, thinking, well, I may use this later. Our time on earth is limited. We shouldn't waste it. We know we should make the right choices every day to maintain our relationship with God. Choices? What do I mean by choices? Well, this is a little story that illustrates the importance of choosing wisely. An old Cherokee Indian was teaching his grandson about life. He explained to the child, a fight is going on inside me. It's a terrible fight between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, hate, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, self-doubt, and ego. The other is good. He's joy, confidence, peace. Love, courage, serenity, humility, kindness, unselfishness, service, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. This same fight is going on in you and every other person too. The grandson thought about this for a moment and then asked, Grandfather, if this fight is going on inside me, how shall I know which wolf will win? The wise old chief turned to his grandson and smiled knowingly and replied, It is simple, my son. The one that will win is the one that you feed. The true source of wisdom is God. He is the one who answers, has answers, solutions, and knowledge to whatever the situation. God wants us to ask him for the gift of wisdom. But the sad thing is, is that so few people take him up on his offer. We feed the wrong wolf within us. We are impatient. We have pride. We want to do it our own way. And so we stumble along, making mistake after mistake. However, James 1 verse 12 said, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Our journey to accepting God's gift of wisdom can be seen as a series of steps and stops. Learning of our failures and mistakes adds to our knowledge and understanding about ourselves. We reflect. We understand them. We become more aware of our limitations, which helps us to grow in compassion and empathy towards others. And in our depths, we are at the height of self-awareness. We are humble and ask for guidance. We desire wisdom. We may have stopped, but only for a while. 
the good world has been fed, and we take another step towards the gift that God so wants to give us, the gift of wisdom. Take it. It will bring contentment and harmony to your life. Amen. We're now going to sing in 604, Holy Wisdom, Now for Learning, and it's to the tune of hymn 252, Beach Street. Lord, we pray for the people we might be tempted to forget, those who are anxious or depressed, 
Those who are struggling emotionally or mentally. Those who are grieving and those who feel they have no one to turn to. Show them they can turn to you and hold your protecting hand. We ask especially for those families caught up in the tragic events in Plymouth. Be with the grieving families and help them to understand why such things happen. Lord, show us the people to whom we might offer welcome and hospitality. We acknowledge the importance of our own safe spaces and as we think back in gratitude to those who show kindness to us, give us the opportunity to extend the same gifts to others. Lord, we pray for those in authority at every level of government, local, national and international. Guide and protect those who set the policy, uphold the law and keep the peace in our country and abroad. We pray for the people, but especially the children of Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria and Somalia, among many others. Put your arms around them, keep them safe and bring them peace. Lord God, for the communities of which we are part, for those with whom we share our lives, and for all who serve our common interests and needs, we praise and bless you. Amen. And our final hymn this morning is hymn number 132, Immortal, Invisible, One of the Ones.